is finally here and we are so excited to get back outside and in the garden. I'm Farah Jadrin. The blooms are starting to come out and the sun is finally shining again after a long dark winter. During this gardening special, we're going to share tips and tricks to make your garden as beautiful as possible and answer some of your questions too. But first, gardening expert Cisco Morris joins New Day Northwest to share what you should be doing now to get your garden ready for spring. Master gardener Cisco Morris has been helping us get our yards ready for spring and he is back today with some more great advice. So basically he's just here to stop me from killing everything in my garden. <laughs> Cisco, thank you so oh, much. Nah, nah. <laughs> I know. It's a big responsibility. That's all I can say. All these plants depend on you. So <laughs> how did we get started? I mean, I see so many beautiful plants. I actually have these in my house right now. I bought them from somewhere, but I don't even know what this oh, is. But watch out for that. That's for Scythia. That oh. this plant is the thug of the garden. This is a thug? Yeah, it's yeah. A thug you plant. know what? You plant that, you go in to have lunch, you come back out, and it's covering 20 feet by 20 feet. <laughs> <laughs> this thing grows like a rabbit, you know? So, why so. is it so important to prune our bushes in the spring? Like, some people can just forget about it and, like, wow, whatever, it's a plant, it does yeah, its yeah. thing. Well, you know, so like, roadies are just starting to bloom now, you know? Okay. But the thing is, after they form these flowers, then what happens is they put out new growth. Okay. That new growth will set a bud on it, and so uh, that's gonna be your flower for next spring. Oh, and so this down here, this nastiness? That's last year's flower that nobody ever pulled off and it looks horrible. Who did that? Where did well, you get these? These I are not your this plants. I from a neighbor's house. <laughs> Knew it. Don't I tell. knew it. Don't tell whatever you do. <laughs> we won't say which neighbor. All right, so what do you do with this? So do you cut this off? Where do you cut it? Well, here's the thing. So people, you know, they don't do anything, and it grows bigger, it grows bigger. Pretty soon you're sitting in the living room trying to look out the picture window, and all you see is the back of a giant rodent tender. So if every year you just go out there, and you know you can you can prune it like that. Okay. And, well, you, know, you just cut it these, right off. These flowers will all be dead now. As soon as they fade, that's when you do the pruning. All right, I'm ready for so, uh, pruning. And I usually I'll, you know, cut so it looks good to do that. Okay. Wow. So it just cuts it off right but below the bloom. Okay. You know what? Yeah. Wherever there's ever been a leaf on a rhododendron, mm -hmm. you can cut. So oh. if this were 20 feet tall and you were tired of it. You could cut it right where there was a leaf. You could cut it down to one inch from the ground and like it would it. grow back. I like it. And you so. Wouldn't, you wouldn't see flowers for 20 years, but or five years, just five. <laughs> Poor neighbors are not going to yeah. see flowers. All right. And, so uh, what about the, the thug, the thug of the bush? The thug. I mean, I wouldn't even know where to cut this, but well, I actually and, and might you, take this home and put it in the You know what base. most people do? They cut it up here. Oh. That's the worst thing you could do because and it looks ugly. <laughs> you get two for the price of one. You're going to get these things. They look like oh, Martian antennas oh, sticking out. Antenna. The whole thing mm -mm, gets like no. that. It's horrible. So what you should do is you should go out and cut a third of the oldest branches right to the ground. Right in the ground. Yeah, as symmetrically as you can. Okay. And if you okay. do that now. Then new ones will grow up to take their place, maybe too many, so you'll thin those out a little. Okay. Never cut the top, it'll get this wonderful fountain shape. Oh la la, it's so beautiful. I have to put a box of tissues where mine is growing because is grown men burst into tears I, I would, when they I, walk I can by. See that. It's just I can like, see that. yeah. <laughs> but if, if this thug gets to be out of control, you could cut the whole shebang to one inch tall. All right, thug. But boy, you're in for work. By the way, what you should do to these camellias that these are These camellias blooming, are beautiful. These are your these, camellias, I can tell. Yep. Yeah. You, know, uh, you know what uh, you should do to these? You gotta thin them out. Okay. So what you do is just go out there and cut out. But there were buds on those. Well, that's, you wait till they're done blooming. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, this is not gonna work so good, you know? Okay. So you thin sense. the livid tweedle out of these, and uh, really? you know, my professor told me in Hort School that you should thin them to the point where a bird can fly right through the bush, but when he was done pruning so them, really a 747 could have gone through the bush. <laughs> oh, la, la, they're so thin. I love 
that. Thank you for sharing that little bit of horticultural knowledge with oh, us. Oh, la la, that looks nice. You know, I when should... you're pruning, you should also try to look good. Oh, <laughs> look at you. You need one in. Was, I know. All right. Um, I find before one I let you go, I have to just ask, you know, for a friend, if you cut back too much, did you kill your plant? Well, on all these that I showed right here, yeah. no. But okay. there's other ones, you know, if you've got something like Daphne or Dora and you cut it down to the ground, well, uh, you'll be shopping for a new Daphne or Dora. <laughs> <laughs> so the best thing you could do is uh, just, you know, maybe go on the web and go, how can I prune this dog on Daphne or Dora? Most plants, you don't want to whack them to the ground unless okay. you really have unless to. You, unless you got a thug. Here are some other seasonal tips to get your garden ready to grow. The master gardeners say any time between April and June is a great time to plant trees, shrubs, and native plants. For your vegetable garden, April is the time to cut back and cover crops. In May, you can harden off vegetable seedlings outside before planting them in the ground. As for your lawn, if you fertilized it in the fall, you don't need to fertilize it again in the spring. That cool fall weather is is the best time to do that. Pruning is another spring gardening task that often mystifies people. When should I cut and how much is okay? Cisco breaks down some of the mystery around pruning roses and lavender. I love the livid Tweedledada roses. And if you take care of them right, they put on a show like you can't believe. But the key is you do have to take care of them right. Okay, so the first thing you do is in the spring, you're gonna cut these things down by two thirds, that's usually around March 1st, uh, to an outward facing bud, and then they grow back uh, much bushier and they flower way better. But there's pruning you have to do in the summer too. If you let them go to rose hips, which is their seeds, then they know they're on earth to reproduce. So they go, all right, I've done my job. I'm gonna kick back, take the rest of the summer off, get a good suntan and do nothing. So you can't let them raise a family. You gotta cut those flowers off, you know. Take that, buddy. So I give a mix of these to my roses every six weeks and they bloom like crazy. So I've made a mix here of uh, the organic fertilizer and the alfalfa meal. And you use two cups per average size tea rose just to give you kind of a guideline. And you want to put this around the entire rose and work it in. If it just sits on the outside, it doesn't work very well and it could even attract rodents. Yeah, I think this is just about perfect now. Nice and worked in. It's not going to attract any rodents, but it's going to make it flower like crazy. I have one last thing you have to do. Make sure that you make some bouquets for your sweetie pie. <laughs> They'll be so impressed when you make a bouquet of these beautiful, fragrant flowers. I wouldn't be surprised if you'll get something really special like a Brussels sprout casserole for dinner. Oh la la! Je suis ce skull. Bonjour mes amis. Hey, do this to your lavender right now and it's gonna look great all summer long. I love the living tweedle out of lavender. It's so fragrant. You get these wonderful flowers. You could even cook with this stuff, some of them. But if you don't do a special thing, you're going to develop bare stems. And before long, this plant is going to be so ugly, you're just going to get rid of it. But there is something that can delay the onset of those bare stems. Now, usually you see me using my hand pruners, but today I'm pulling out the heavy artillery. And uh, all you people at home, don't let your spouse get their hands on these. They'll turn all your plants into balls and donuts. But these plants, the trick to keeping them from getting bare stems 
is you have to shear them down to one half inch above the bare stems. This time year, every spring. Okay, let's go for it. So we don't want to cut into the old woody stems down here. We want to cut about a half inch above those. If you cut down to the very bottom, it'll grow back one year if you're lucky, and then the whole plant will just fall apart. Okay, I admit it. This is going to look a little hacked back. That's why I don't listen to the books that tell you to do this in fall, because you'll have an ugly plant sitting there all winter long. If you do it in spring, this will start growing right away. Before you know it, you'll be seeing those beautiful blooms coming out of here. Now, I have to give you a warning at now before I quit, and that is, if you prune your lavender like I just described, you're going to gain weight. That's because you're going to think of Provence when you're pruning it. Next thing you know, you're in the house eating baguettes and pan au chocolat. Throughout the show, we're taking your gardening questions right to Cisco. First up, Julian Tacoma says they have a cherry tree that's been planted for three years and they're worried about how to prune it correctly. Here's Cisco. Well, it's, it's a little tricky pruning a cherry okay. tree for the first time. You probably don't want this thing, if it's a dwarf cherry, then you probably don't want it to get, you know, 40 feet tall, because okay. dwarfs will in time. Oh. So you might want to prune to control the height. Okay. But when you do that, it's going to make a lot of other branches going go. Out. Okay. So uh, normally what we do is just thin them out. If there's any crossing branches, mm -hmm. you'll take out the weakest one. Okay. And. Uh, you know, try and open it up, get some of those sprouts out of the middle because that's where uh, you're going to get better air circulation and that'll keep your tree a lot healthier and prettier. Crows are ravaging lawns all across western Washington. Several King 5 viewers have written to us asking why it's happening and how to stop it. King 5 meteorologist Leah Pizzetti with our Environment Northwest team shows us this problem is buried deeper than the grass. This federal way backyard is an oasis. Just keeping it natural, trying to do what I can to help, you know, the native flora and fauna. Created by Camille Parazelski to welcome flying friends. My three-year-old knows, like, names of birds and, like, we'll call it out. Until recently, when one specific kind took over. I did not expect this, and at the ferocity at which they went to task was pretty insane. It's a widespread problem in this neighborhood. A murder of crows destroying lawns. At each crime scene, blades of grass and a mess. So we called in back up. Hi. Hello. Welcome. <laughs> nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Gardening expert Cisco Morris says the criminal might not be the obvious culprit, despite the damage. Because this is becoming a big problem. As you can see, your neighbors got uh -huh. it. And... But together, All right. they can dig a little deeper and get to the root of it. Break that up a little. Let's see if we see something in there. Within seconds, the real suspect is revealed. That's a European chafer beetle grub. An invasive species yeah. found in the Pacific Northwest only in the last 10 years. It's kind of like a horror story. You know? The beetles, just as bad for lawns as crows, if not worse. They're eating the roots, so they're, they're wrecking your lawn either way, whether the crows, it's not gonna look like this but it's going to thin out really bad. So while the crows seem like the suspects. Unfortunately, they could be, a, they're kind of sloppy eaters, you know. <laughs> they're actually the heroes. You've got pests and then the, the beneficials come in and eat up the bad guys. And uh, it's all kind of, it is kind of the circle of, of all of it. And uh, so crows, they, they're just, they are actually helping out, hard to believe as it is. And with this new development, Camille is back to welcoming all birds to her home, even the murder of crows. They are back on my friend list here, uh, no longer in the, in the, in the doghouse as it were. This criminal investigation. Thank you for figuring this out, gross. Now complete. Case closed. 
We love our four legged friends. I know I do, but if you're trying to make your lawn look nice, your pooch may not be helping. Let's get back to Cisco to answer this question from Aaron, who wants to know what is the best grass for dogs? Oh, no. You have dogs. My, I have dogs. I, I've had dogs since I was a little kid. My wife and I actually measure how many years we've been married by how many dogs we've that had. Makes sense. <laughs> but here's the bad news there's no grass that could deal with with oh, dogs, okay. you know, and if you have more than one, they're gonna tear that lawn to shreds. And all you could do is wait for them to get older. When they finally get a little older, they don't play quite as mm. hard. And they're always gonna have one trail through the lawn, no matter what. But don't replace the lawn with mulch or anything. Okay. Just, just wait. You know, if they dig holes, that's the worst. Then you gotta put some fencing over it or something, mm -hmm. fill it up with soil. And uh, you could put some seed in there. When the dogs get older, you can rent an aerator machine, you know, that pulls the little plugs out of the lawn. Looks like somebody had a Chihuahua festival out there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and then you could drop the seed in the holes because okay. the seed won't come, won't come up well if you just put it on the areas that are all dead. You got to okay. get them down in the ground and that works perfect. So you'll have a lawn. You just got to wait eight or nine years. This spring, we're coming off an El Nino winter. That means there's a greater chance for warmer and drier conditions. King 5 meteorologist Adam Claybon has your long range forecast and what we're expecting weather wise this spring. Hey there everyone, I'm meteorologist Adam Claybon. Time to take a look back at this El Nino winter and what happened during it. And also we're gonna talk about what's ahead for the upcoming spring season and how El Nino could be heading out and La Nina could be returning. First, a look back at the numbers because typically during an El Nino winter, we see drier than normal conditions and warmer than normal conditions. And January's numbers don't really reflect that at all. First, the temperature is cooler than normal. And you can see the precipitation above normal for January. February, we were slightly above normal with our temperatures. What we saw as far as precipitation, also slightly above normal. So when you factor in the two months, we were cooler and wetter than normal. But you also have to consider what happened back in December and December was the warmest December on record out at SeaTac Airport coming in at 45.5 degrees for an average temperature. Normally we're at 42 and you can see the average rainfall at about five and three quarters. We saw almost eight and a half inches of rain, which yeah, Overall, it was a warmer than normal winter for us, but also a wetter than normal one too, which really helped out with some of our drought conditions we were seeing leading into the season, which we're going to talk a little more about here in a second. First though, El Nino, what's happening? Well, you can see the blue showing up here across the Pacific. That's where those bodies of water right now are beginning to cool below their normal temperatures. And that's when we are going to see a little more of this La Nina pattern start to eventually shape up for us, especially as we head closer to next fall and heading into next winter, which is a highly amplified jet stream. Now, what we did see quite a bit of too, especially back throughout February, was more the zonal flow. El Nino brings that and it brought quite a few systems here across California, which definitely brought them a lot more of the wet weather and the milder weather too. Now for us, the rainfall definitely helped out throughout this past season. This is where we stand right now as far as our drought monitor and we see some drought still in place. That's where we have some of the tans and a lot of abnormally dry soil, but this is where we were back in November and you can see how just much more of a concern we had at that point with severe and extreme drought showing up here across a lot of our Cascade Mountains. Things improving again. It's been wetter than normal, but something we're to keep an eye out for is how El Nino continues to go more neutral here as we head over the next three months heading into spring and we get more of this La Nina to take over as we head into summer, which could lead to some drier conditions here as we head on into the latter part of these next three months. What we're also seeing too is in the Pacific North American Oscillation, your PNA, and this is beginning to head more positive than negative. And when you have more of a positive, you have more ridging, more high pressure in place, which often leads to sunnier and drier weather, warmer weather too, to go along with that. And that's what we're seeing as far as the forecast heading into the next three months for spring. Looks like we're going to be drier than normal as well as warmer than normal, which 
might not be a bad thing if you're trying to get an early start on your planting. As you're picking out your new plants for your garden, it's good to know what gardening zone you live in. The USDA has mapped the whole country into zones that correspond to how cold a region generally gets in winter. They go from zone one, which gets really cold, to zone 13, which doesn't get below 65 degrees. Most of western Washington is in zones eight and nine. So when you're deciding what plants to buy, be sure to check the tag to see if the plant makes sense for our climate. If you're picking out veggies to grow this year, lettuce may be an easy first crop. Cisco explains how to get started. Well, spring is sort of sprung. <laughs> and one thing I love about spring is that you get to grow your own salad. And I'll tell you what, I am a salad hound, so I can't wait to get them going. And by the way, you don't have to have a big space to plant lettuce and uh, salad greens, you could do it in a little pot and you'll be eating salad greens for a long time. First thing you got to do, I bought some good potting soil, got a little pot with good drainage, and I made sure that I got some all-purpose organic fertilizer. Now, I'm gonna grow peas. I love snap peas, they're so good. These snap peas that I got and I bought these starts at my local nursery, they uh, get three feet tall. So in order to grow those and have it uh, work, I need to give them a trellis. Is this the coolest trellis you ever saw? We'll put the little birdie in the front. I'll just stick one right down there. And these will just cling right to this cool trellis. So this is giant red mustard, and it tastes so good. Oh, oh, that is so tasty. So I've got all this wonderful mustard in here. Now I want one of my all-time favorite salad greens. So this is arugula, and it's really good for you. So I'll tell you what, I'm a big walker, and after I eat arugula, I walk like a rocket. Now for the grand finale, you want to make sure that you water this in, because you kind of have to beat the tweedle out of these things to get them out of those little pots. They'll come back like little gangbusters. I'll just come out and pick individual leaves off every night for my salads, and I'll be eating salads with great peas, by the way, for weeks and weeks out of this pot right here. Oh la la, I can't wait. As you're planting your vegetable garden, make sure you're arranging the seedlings next to ones that will grow well together. It's called companion planting. Cisco shares more on how it works. So it's time to plant spring veggies, which is so exciting. But did you know that vegetables are like people? A lot of them really don't like each other. Others love each other. So we got to figure out which ones to put together. So what is better than like snap peas and snow peas in the spring? I love these so much. So what do they love? They love salad greens, so they're crazy about spinach, so we can plant those around there. And I, ooh, I got some nice yummy lettuce, and all oh, peas and lettuce just love each other. I can stick some of this great mustard in there, that'll do really good. But whatever you do, don't plant onions anywhere near peas. Nothing in the onion family next to the pea family. Not by beans, not anything. And I mean chives, garlic, nothing like that. Because uh, peas and onions hate each other. Neither of them do well if they're near each other. So carrots love everybody, you know. You could grow them with any salad greens. And I hear the onions back there crying. Don't feel bad, onions because carrots absolutely love you 
if you grow carrots around your uh, onions, the onions repel the carrot rust fly, which is really good. Who else we got here? Okay, we've got the diva of the vegetable garden here. These are Brussels sprouts. Now it's a little early to plant these, but I'm gonna give it a try anyway. These guys don't like hardly anybody. <laughs> they hate the salad greens. They're not that crazy about carrots, but they love onions. So you two get to hang out together. <laughs> I hope you have a good time. Finally, I've got one more thing you wanna plant in your garden. Plant some lavender out there. The blue flowers are so attractive. The bees, you'll get pollinators, and so you're gonna get a lot more fruit on your veggies as summer goes along. Oh, la, la. There's nothing worse than coming out to your vegetable garden only to discover the fruits of your labor have already been eaten by snails. Cisco shows us how to get rid of these mollusks safely and effectively. The biggest menace we've got in the Pacific Northwest is slugs and snails. It drives gardeners crazy. Right here, I've got this beautiful Ligularia. Snails and slugs consider this a gourmet treat. And look at what I just discovered right there. One little bad ombre for sure. All right, you're gonna pay for this, buddy. I'll get you later. All right, so uh, you can see there's some damage in this. And uh, yep, there's a hole right there. That means a snail was here. So I've got to use this defensive device. So this is the new slug bait that's got iron phosphate for the main ingredients. It's so safe, the woman at the Flyer and Garden Show was eating it all day to show how safe it is. I haven't seen her since then, but oh la la. Okay, now here's what people do wrong. They get a big fat handful of this, and then they just throw it in there, and it breaks down really fast. So you're wasting an expensive thing. The way to use this is sprinkle it in, about not very much you see I'm just gonna it's probably gonna be one handful of this and you want to do this like every three days if you got a plant like Ligular that the slugs love hosta any of those so that's the way to do it just make sure that it's in there uh, I never put it on the plant I put it underneath as safe as it is people ask me well what if my dog ate some or something well you know, if you sprinkle a little like that, if your dog eats a little, I'm sure it's not gonna do it any harm. But I have heard that dogs, if they get in to the whole container, if like you leave this sitting there and the dog knocks it over and eats it all, then you're gonna have a problem. So what I recommend is do my little invention here. So I took two pieces of plywood, just uh, nailed them together and uh, you sprinkle, you just sprinkle it and then put this over the top. The Fido's not gonna get to that. I call this invention Slimy's Diner. <laughs> I should patent this. <laughs> so if you do a little at a time, like I do, and you do it, you know, every three days or something, the only slugs and snails gonna be left in your garden are the ornamental kind. Other garden pests like deer and bunnies could threaten your spring blooming flowers. Cisco shows us which bulbs the critters won't go for. Nothing cheers up the garden like spring blooming bulbs. And boy, there are so many great ones to choose from. The problem is deer and rabbits and bulls and other critters tend to eat them up. So you gotta find the ones those guys will leave alone. Here's one of my all time favorite. There's no bulb easier to grow than grape hyacinth. Look at those blue little flowers. And the best thing about them is that the bunnies and the deer don't eat them. Hey, wait a minute. What is this? 
Well, they're not supposed to eat them. Okay, I guarantee they're not going to eat the ones I'm about to show you now. Look at these beautiful flowers. These are my favorite flower on earth, except for a couple others I'm going to show you in a minute. So these are called Chinodoxa, or Glory of the Snow. And these can even grow in Wisconsin. And I remember when I was a kid, they would come up and peek out over the snow. So they're a wonderful plant. They're coming up all over the garden. This is one plant it can come up wherever it wants. I love the living tweedle out of this thing. This thing is so special. It's a fritillaria. This little beautiful plant has one thing it needs. No, no deer, no rabbit will ever touch it, but they die out for a lot of people. And, you know, they don't like too much sun. They hate drying out. So here's my trick. This is my favorite little bird bath, and all the birds love this. It's an old petrified stone. So I always add water to it, and the water always comes down this side and keeps this spot nice and moist. So it's a special trick, and I've had these for years thanks to this. Oh la la. And here's a wildflower you can't go wrong with. So it's called Erythronium. People call it dog tooth lily. And I guarantee no deer, no rabbit, no nada is gonna bite this thing. All they need is a little sun and they just become a bigger and bigger clump. Just indestructible. So I leave you with one thought. When I was a little kid, I had the cutest little pet bunny you'll ever see in your life. I hate those bunnies now! While Cisco's helping solve some of our gardening woes, let's get back to him to answer another viewer question. Jamie says her clematis has powdery mold on it. Yeah, powdery mildew, it attacks plants that are under stress. Okay. So for, for whatever reason that plant's under stress. It needs a long walk. Yeah, the beach it, yeah, it does. It, you got to talk to it nicer. <laughs> Don't <laughs> bore it though, whatever you do. But uh, what I would do is thin it out a little when it grows up so that it's not so crowded, more air circulation. Don't get the foliage wet. That's going to cause all kinds of trouble. And uh, I think um, just uh, fertilize it well. And uh, by the end of the season, it may get powdery mildew. If it does, you could spray it with a product called neem oil. This is an oil squeezed out of a tree from India. Okay. Safe stuff, it's vegetable oil. You spray it on there, first sign of mildew, it'll get rid of it. Before you get gardening, you'll want to have the right tools in your shed. We took a trip to the nursery with Cisco so he could show us some of the must-have garden gadgets. We're here at Swanson's Nursery where I'm going to find some really cool garden gizmos that will make gardening more fun and easier for you. Okay, I've already got every one of these gizmos that I'm going to show you, but I love every one of them, so I know they're good. So this is something you absolutely have to have. If you're a right-hander, you want Felco number eights. If you're a lefty, you want Felco number nines. It's, it's, it fits a small hand really well. It's really a wonderful tool. You should have your Felco pruners every time you walk out the door of the garden. They're like the six gun for the old west cowboy. I sleep with that under my pillow. Now here is a tool you need. This is not a pogo stick, but this will aerate your lawn. It pulls those plugs out. Now, so you just get on there and stomp that down. This is the mega plugger right here. <laughs> just don't try and plug a whole big lawn with one of these. You'll be walking like a cowboy that rode the horse way too long. How many times have you 
turned on the sprinkler and forgot to turn it off, wasted water, drenched an area. You could even flood your basement. So you need a timer. Oh la la, this thing looks pretty complicated. Let's see if we can find something a little simpler. Here's my kind of uh, timer right here. You just set it for the amount of time that you want to run it, turn it on, it'll turn itself off. This is my baby. You don't have to have a doctor degree in uh, faucet timers to put one of these to work. So if you're like me and you bring dirt into the house, marriage counseling is getting so expensive, so you need a good doormat. Boy, that one's pretty cute. Like that. Oh, la, la. Look at this lady beetle. Oh, man. No doubt about it. This baby's coming home with me. I got the last one. Oh, boy. Oh, that is so cool. Thanks so much for joining us today and happy gardening.